Hello and welcome to Urban Farmer. Uh, today we are talking to Dr. K. K. Narayanan on kitchen garden in the city. Dr. K. K. Narayanan is a founder and managing director of Meta Helix Life Sciences, which is now a Tata Group, Bangalore-based agri biotech company. He has a PhD in plant breeding and genetics and did his postdoctoral work at the Department of Biological Sciences, Stanford University. He is also chairman of Kotaram Agro Foods, an award-winning company which makes packed food products using traditional Indian grains like ragi under the brand Soulful. Dr. Narayanan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sri Ram. And uh, nice to meet you all once again. So today I will discuss uh, a few aspects about how to set up a kitchen garden uh, in your urban homes. Uh, you may not be able to maybe get all the vegetables you require from your garden uh, that has to come from commercial farming by farmers, but at least part of the requirement you can satisfy by uh, putting together a kitchen garden. It will also be a nice pastime and uh, most of you, if you get engaged, I believe uh, it can be quite a pleasurable uh, uh, way to spend the time. Now, uh, several considerations have to be kept in mind when you want to plan a kitchen garden. Now, if you have a house with a compound, you can identify a part of the land in your compound where you can raise a kitchen garden where several crops can be grown. Alternatively, you can actually raise a kitchen garden on your terrace or if you have an exposed balcony, that is also a good place where you can keep some pots. Uh, but make sure that whether it's the land you choose or the terrace, portion of the terrace or the balcony, plants need adequate sunlight for their growth and development. So try to identify such a place where there is uh, enough sunlight falling for most of the day at least, if not for uh, the entire duration of the daytime. If there are some shaded trees uh, which is uh, covering up the place, you may want to lop them so that you allow more sunshine to come in. Now, having chosen the place, I think the next consideration is how do you prepare the soil if it's uh, part of your compound or how do you prepare uh, the potting uh, system? Now, if it is on the ground, uh, the ideal method would be to have two or three diggings so that you kind of disturb the top soil to about nine to 12 inches from the surface and if there are clods you may want to powder them uh, by repeated digging or using a mallet or something so that you get a nice fine tilt and depending on the crop that you want to grow you can either make raised beds which are about nine inches uh, from the ground and about uh, one and a half to two feet wide and of convenient length or you can make uh, you know, furrows, which are spaced at about one to one and a half feet uh, between furrows for planting various different crops, which I will try to explain as we go forward. If you want to use your terrace or part of your balcony, I would suggest that uh, you use uh, pots or grow bags, which are plastic grow bags, which come of different sizes. For most of the annual crops or the seasonal crops, uh, a pot or a grow bag which is of about 9 to 12 inches size and talking about the circumference at the top and of appropriate height would be more than sufficient. Uh, for some of the perennial crops uh, like curry leaf or things also which you can grow uh, either in your uh, kitchen garden which is on the land or on the terrace you need slightly bigger grow bags particularly if it is growing on your terrace. Now, talking about the uh, soil medium, I told you how you prepare the soil 
uh, if it is grown on the ground. But uh, for pots and uh, grow bags, you can uh, make a potting mixture. A potting mixture is a mixture of garden soil, uh, which contains adequate levels of sand. You know, ideally they call it the sandy loam soil. Uh, it is not too clay, which holds the water. It has got enough sand particles so that there is enough drainage in the whole system. And you can add an equal amount of uh, well decomposed farmyard manure or uh, uh, even dried cow dung, dried and powdered uh, cow dung, which is well decomposed, which is quite old, kept for some time. That would be ideal. Don't use fresh cow dung because that can also attract many insects and uh, other pathogens. Uh, alternatively, you can uh, buy potting mixtures uh, from some of these companies. Now, if you want to carry these things to the terrace, I would advise you to make the potting mixture lighter by at least adding a part of it uh, with uh, coco pit. Coco pit is the pith that comes from the extraction of fiber from the coconut husk. So by that contains the fresh uh, cocoa pith contains uh, certain tannins and certain uh, elements which actually inhibit plant growth. So you may want to buy the cocoa pith. So they actually condition it by composting it and then washing it thoroughly many times. There's a process through which it grows so that it becomes a useful medium. You can either use it 100% uh, for some uh, leafy crops, but I would suggest that you actually mix it with the potting mixture that you have made so that the pot will be easier to carry. It will be much lighter than a fully weighed pot with uh, the soil mixture. Now coming to, uh, I told you that you add uh, uh, organic matter, whether it is the soil that you make, cow dung or compost. In the pots, you can also add, to increase the carbon content, you can add some of the oil cakes or neem cake, for example, which you can buy, you know, maybe, you know, half a kilo per pot uh, of the size that I mentioned would be, for the bigger pot, you may have to add a little more and then mix it thoroughly so that this will uh, be in the pot and it will also, by the action of microorganisms, it will decompose and it will provide the necessary organic carbon, plus a few minor nutrients that is required for the plant's growth. Now coming to, uh, you may also want to add uh, a little bit of superphosphate, which is a source of phosphorus for the plant's growth in the potting mixture itself. So I would recommend instead of any specific measure, you can add uh, maybe one to two teaspoons of uh, super phosphate. And if you are growing annuals uh, continuously in the pot one after the other, you may also want to supplement with a teaspoon of diammonium phosphate, which actually provides both uh, uh, nitrogen as well as the phosphorus. Now for potassium is another major nutrient that you should uh, be uh, concerned about and the plants need them. So a little bit of murate of potash, uh, MOP they call it, you can buy it from any agricultural store. Again, uh, half a teaspoon. Don't add more because uh, you can, uh, after every crop you can add and mix them. But at one time if you add more, uh, they may do more harm than actually. It is better to be cautious, you know, add a little bit and then see the impact on the plant growth. And then rather than trying to dump more of it. Now in the soil beds also you can mix the soil with uh, uh, super phosphate. You can, if you have a, a area of about 100 square feet uh, of your kitchen garden on the ground in the compound, you may add about one kilogram of uh, super phosphate. And there you can add the sources of nitrogen and potash as top dressing rather than as uh, a basal dressing. Now, coming to the uh, crops that you can grow, you know, many of these crops uh, grow in our tropical climates very well. Now, if you talk about uh, perennials, I mentioned about perennials, if you are growing it on the terrace or in the balcony, you need to have uh, bigger grow bags or bigger pots curry leaf, 
uh, uh, can be a good uh, perennial. That means it uh, uh, survives for many years once you plant them. The seedlings can be obtained from a nursery and you can plant them or you can from, from your friend or somebody who has curry leaf in their compound. You may find small seedlings which are there at the bottom of the major plant and you can actually remove them without disturbing the roots and then get them planted in your planted or in the uh, corner of your compound. Another crop which can come up very well, which is a fruit crop is uh, papaya. And papaya, there are many, many different varieties. Some of them are also prone to diseases. In fact, there's a good variety of papaya called red lady, which is uh, actually a hybrid. So it starts yielding pretty early in about six months from planting. Papaya is a transplanted crop. So you need to buy the seed from a, a reliable source. You need to raise a nursery in a small plastic cover. And once the seedlings are about one feet height, you need to plant them into the planter or on the ground. So one or two uh, papaya plants uh, would uh, provide for the family fruits uh, whenever uh, it is seasonal. You can have banana, uh, which is another uh, favorite crop of South Indians. So we have uh, many varieties of banana. You can have either the Cavendish type, one or two plants. They will be ideally suited if it is the, the kitchen garden is on the ground. But many people grow it on the terrace as well as uh, may not be so much in their balcony unless their balcony is really uh, very big. Now coming to the uh, annual or the seasonal vegetables, there are many, many categories. It will be good rather than to have a monocrop, it will be good to have a mixture of crops uh, so that uh, you, know, you also have a balance of different kinds of vegetables for different preparations and also to use as salads. See, some of the salad crops can be palak. Palak is very easy to grow. You can get the seeds from uh, reliable sources. All amaranthus, kirai, as we call it. So these are once you, uh, again, both uh, palak and amaranthus, you can germinate. The seeds are very, very tiny. So if you plant them on the ground or in the pot, and if you are not very, very careful, what happens is, the seeds get taken away by the ants and other insects. Or sometimes birds may come and forage on it. So you may not find the seed. So you may think that it's a problem with the seed germination, but the seed itself would have gone. So the good idea to germinate them in what you call a spore trays, which are uh, uh, plastic trays in which there are uh, holes in it, where you can add a little bit of cocoa pit and then put the seeds. Once they germinate, along with the cocoa pit plug, you can plant them wherever you want them to grow. So these are short duration crops, so you can take the first cutting of the leaves. You need to harvest them when they are still tender. So it may take about 25 to 30 days before they are ready for harvest. Some of them, some varieties are multi-cut, uh, but uh, most of them, once you cut and harvest them, you may have to have the next uh, planting so that you get another crop of uh, this crop. And uh, in a year, uh, you can have uh, uh, seven to 10 cuttings, uh, which will be good. You can use it as a salad or in various preparations that we usually make in South India. Now, in terms of uh, other vegetables, you know, the solanaceous vegetables form a major group. They include uh, vegetables like tomato, uh, chili, chili pepper, uh, brinjal. Now, these vegetables, uh, you know, the duration of these uh, will vary anything between three and a half to six to seven months. And uh, these are usually transplanted crops. So what it means is the seeds are small. You again germinate them in the pot trays. And once they are about four to six centimeters in height, which may take between 25 to 35 to 40 days, uh, you can transplant them wherever you want them to finally grow. Now, uh, you can have uh, other kinds of vegetables like wines. For example, uh, cucurbits, you know, your cucumber, uh, your chow chow, these are all cucurbits and they grow as wines. For these, you may have to provide uh, uh, a frame on which they can actually grow. Either you can build the frame around the pot in which you have sown them, 
these are directly sown crops so you have to sow them uh, right in the pot or in the ground in the furrows and then allow a frame around so that they can climb and then uh, the fruits actually hang so snake god bitter god uh, ridge god there are many many different types of uh, cucurbits and uh, people have different preferences of them and uh, they are all uh, tropical so in uh, uh, throughout the year, you can grow one or the other uh, cucurbit crop. It will be useful to combine uh, certain leguminous crops also along uh, with these in your kitchen garden. See, they include uh, things like, uh, for example, French bean and uh, cowpea, for example, the long bean that we have, which is uh, cowpea, uh, ridge, go uh, the uh, there are several types of beans, lab lab bean, for example. Now, whichever uh, sword bean, which are quite big and uh, very long, there are special preparations using that. So these uh, will actually provide the proteins and certain different kinds of nutrients. So uh, adding them to your kitchen garden would be good. A few considerations when you grow the crops. You know, uh, always try to follow a crop rotation. What it means is in the same pot or in the same place, don't keep growing the same vegetable or the same uh, species. Uh, it will always be good if you alternate, uh, let us say, a solanaceous crop or a cucurbit with a legume crop. The legume, uh, in addition uh, to it uh, giving you nice tasty vegetables, uh, it also has the property of fixing nitrogen because they have got in their roots nodules in these nodules uh, certain symbiotic bacteria reside these are called rhizobium and the rhizobium is able to fix atmospheric nitrogen you know crop plants in general most of the species can uh, cannot need nitrogen nitrogen phosphorus and potassium are the major nutrients that they need in addition there are several other nutrients which plants need even though our atmosphere is almost 70, around 70% 70 nitrogen, the plants cannot utilize the atmospheric nitrogen directly. So they have to be fixed into soluble forms in the soil by certain microorganisms. So one such microorganism is rhizobium, which lives in association with these leguminous crops. So you actually, instead of supplementing nitrogen externally, either through farmyard manure or, or through even synthetic fertilizers like uh, diammonium phosphate I mentioned to you earlier or urea, uh, some amount of nitrogen is fixed by these bacteria so the soil gets enriched. Otherwise, you should remember that each time we grow a crop, the crop needs all these minerals are absorbed in the soluble form as they take in the water and uh, they actually become part of the tissues. So when we harvest a produce, we are taking away some amount of these nutrients so in some ways, we are mining the nutrients from the soil. So they have to be replenished. That is the principle of fertilization. So when we talk about fertilization, I think the major nutrients uh, for annual crops, I said you can add it as a basal dressing. Or uh, alternatively, if you look at the package of practices by various uh, uh, universities and agricultural organizations, for each crop, there is a specific recommendation for some of these nutrients. So it will involve multiple applications, which will be basal dressing, which is uh, when the land is prepared or when the pot is filled, that is basal dressing. And then top dressings, which are while the plant is growing at different critical stages of the crop, you can provide these nutrients. Usually phosphorus, that is super phosphate I mentioned to you, is given as a basal dressing. Nitrogen and potash, it could be in different forms, urea, ammonium sulfate, uh, diammonium phosphate, so or murate of potash. These are provided as top dressings. They can also be provided as a spray because it is, urea is soluble. Murate of potash is also soluble. So you can make a 0.5% solution and then uh, use a sprayer to spray it on the canopy and then these gets absorbed into the crop plants. Now, one major consideration when you grow vegetables uh, is pathogens and pests. Now, uh, if you like the vegetable, uh, you know, they are juicy, nice looking, soft, 
they are also preferred by these uh, pests. And uh, see the commercial way of uh, managing the pests people use or the recommended practice is called integrated pest management, which involves uh, use of uh, scientific use of certain chemicals, use of biological methods to control, for example, certain parasites or certain uh, bacterial formulations like uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt. These are used for biological control. You can also use physical methods like going and picking out the this ones, allowing birds to forage, but in a kitchen garden, uh, which is of the size that we are discussing here, uh, whether it be in part of your compound or whether in the terrace, I would recommend that you try to use more of physical methods and also physical containment methods. So if you can grow these things under a net house, a net house is, you know, you can build a frame around the plot or on the terrace uh, where you want to grow these uh, plants or where you want to keep the pots. And then you can have a polythene uh, cover. These are the UV stabilized polythene sheets are available at the top so that uh, you can regulate the irrigation and stuff. You know, it's not exposed to the elements. And on the sides, you can have again UV uh, protected uh, nets, uh, which are like mosquito nets, but these are not very, very expensive. You can build them so that you essentially physically contain your plants and prevent the external intrusion from external uh, outside, the insects and other pets which can come in. In spite of these measures, if you still find some lot of these uh, Lepidoptera pests, Lepidoptera means the family to which butterflies and moths belong. So Lepidoptera pests like to uh, attack these, for example, brinjal, fruit and shoot border is a common pest. As soon as you see an infestation, try to physically remove that fruit or the leaf and then physically separate it, you know, take it out of the kitchen garden area and then destroy it somewhere. That would be one method. And if it is a small area, you can manage it that way. Now, uh, 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 fertilizer management, pests and diseases, uh, uh, these are some things, you know, very, very basic principle I just mentioned to you. Now, harvesting is another important operation. You need to harvest these fruits and uh, vegetables uh, at the right stage. Particularly for vegetables, uh, you don't allow them to mature too much, whether it is the leafy vegetable or brinjal or solanaceous or cucurbits. They need to be tender. So you will slowly, you know, with experience, you will realize which is the right stage to harvest. Some of these gods, if they over mature, they will become very fibrous. In fact, it will be very difficult to consume it. So you have to harvest it at the right stage. And with some experience, I think uh, you will get used to figuring out which is the right stage at which you should harvest. Now, you can go on and on about it, but uh, I would probably stop here. But uh, just tell you that uh, kitchen gardening is a very pleasurable activity. Uh, you know, you can see things growing. If you like plants and slowly you will actually start uh, getting an emotional connect with your plants you will uh, they will like they say that you know uh, if you are a, a passionate farmer the plants actually talk to you you can actually figure out uh, whether the plant is craving for some micronutrient or it is saying that i need water okay that process irrigation is another important thing so you need to uh, provide adequate water for these plants water them at least uh, once every day or once in two days depending on the external conditions. During rainy seasons, you can uh, reduce the frequency. During summer months, don't overwater. I think in watering, what is very, very important is drainage is as important as irrigation. So if you have the pots, make sure that the holes at the bottom of the plots are open. And uh, before you add the potting mixture, you can actually put a tile piece or a stone just to cover it so that the potting mixture does not drain through it, but it allows the excess water to drain out. So don't overwater, stagnating, stagnating water is not good for these plants. The water, as soon as you water, uh, also don't use a pipe and then uh, force the water onto the plants. If you have a watering can, that will be uh, an ideal tool to water these plants. 
Now, in addition to those, uh, uh, I think these are pretty simple. You need a, probably a shower, a rake, uh, and uh, maybe uh, some gloves uh, when you handle some of these plants so that you know, uh, your hand doesn't get rough. You are not used, unlike a farmer who are used to handling soil and uh, plants and all that, uh, they have calloused hands, but uh, if you want, because we are not, uh, you know, practicing or what to say, full-time farmers. In such case, you know, some of these gardening gloves also, also can come in handy. That's it. Now, if you have questions, you can show Terrific. Them. Terrific. Awesome, doctor. And, you know, pretty, this one is so illuminating. You know, I always, I have, I have tried my hand maybe two times or three times at, you know, kitchen garden. I always thought it, you know, just packing some soil into a pot, throw some seeds and, you know, expect it to grow. So every time it was a hit or miss. <laughs> now I realized there is so much method to it, you know, so illuminating this one. Now I realize how much preparation, planning, pretty much like every project. <laughs> okay. I, you have answered pretty much every question that I have prepared. So anyway, let me go through the questions. The questions I wanted to ask you is, will the vegetables and fruits grown in pots have more nutrition than the ones grown in soil? You have answered a bit on that on the, when you said about the mining part. But anyway, let me have your reply on that. Uh, no, I think uh, as long as uh, you are providing the uh, nutrients in adequate amounts and in the proper balanced way, uh, whether you grow it in the pot or whether you grow it on the ground, uh, I think uh, the result would be the same. And it also depends on uh, the correct stage at which you harvest these uh, vegetables and how you store them post uh, harvesting. Wow. Okay. Another Are you able to get that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pardon, come again? Uh, were you able to get that? Yes, 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 I already get that, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, you have also identified the problems in the uh, plants. I was wanting to ask you, what are the top three issues with plants in a home garden and the remedies? Uh, see, if you look at diseases, a very common disease, uh, particularly for those uh, crops where you have to grow it in a nursery or in the poor trays, as I mentioned, and then transplant them, is damping off. See, the seedlings, when they are young, they are quite vulnerable. So there are so several soil uh, pathogens, particularly uh, fungi, fungal pathogens. Examples are Pythium, Phytophthora, they cause a disease called a damping off. That is when the seedlings germinate and out, they infect the collar region of the seedling and the seedling will suddenly start wilting and even fall down. So damping off can be prevented by using certain fungicides in the uh, potting mixture. A very old, very conventional uh, and cheap uh, fungicide which we can make at our homes and uh, is the Bordeaux mixture. You know, Bordeaux mixture because it was first discovered by uh, certain uh, abbots in uh, France in Bordeaux. And uh, it is actually a mixture of uh, uh, lime, which uh, we use in our pan and all those things, and copper sulfate. So it is a chelated form of copper. So it doesn't... Uh, act as a toxin to the plant, but at the same time, it actually controls the fungus. Now, the method of making the Bordeaux mixture uh, has to be carefully uh, understood. Otherwise, you know, you can uh, make uh, a mistake and it could be more damaging than controlling the pest itself. So that I will probably explain in a, uh, in a different segment. But Bordeaux mixture, you can Google it. So is, is a way of protecting the plant. The other thing is you get the seeds from reputed uh, companies or organizations. You know, conditioned seeds are always stronger and uh, better. Their germination percentages are higher. And usually they are treated with, uh, the seeds itself are treated with some fungicides. Now, primarily to uh, prevent the problems of damping off. 
So that is one common pr uh, problem. The other, uh, once the plant comes up, uh, I told you, the major pests belong to this Lepidopteran family or the butterfly and moth family. There are seven, they are uh, most damaging in the larval stage. That is when they are this caterpillar. They tend to eat, they could be either borers of the fruit, which actually uh, bores a small hole, entry hole, and then eats the fruit inside out. Or they could be leaf eaters, or they could uh, sit on the leaf and then eat up the leaf. You know, leaves are very important because uh, that is where most of the photosynthesis happens. And uh, the sunlight is captured, converted into assimilates, which allow the plants to grow and develop. So if the leaves are all eaten up, uh, or the plant is defoliated, as you call it, it causes a lot of problems. In kitchen gardens, uh, you can use certain mild uh, uh, chemical agents as well, provided it is at an early stage, because each of those chemical agents have got a period of waiting period before the produce can be safely consumed. So if you use it scientifically and within that period, there is you actually your produce is pretty safe. But if it is a small garden, and uh, I think I would recommend that you know everybody who is growing a kitchen garden should go and inspect the plants or be with them at least for some time during the day. You can inspect them, and if you really find a caterpillar or larvae, you can pluck them out and keep them out. Now, when I told you that you should have a net house or a physical barrier which protects your plant, uh, most of these insect pest problems can be uh, addressed if you physically contain the plants within the plant. And that is what I would recommend for a small area. This may not be practical when you talk about field scale cultivation, but in a small area, this is possible. Wow. Okay. The other question I wanted to ask you is, you know, with the COVID-19 and um, the, the state of economy is going to be a real, real difficult, you know, employment may be a challenge. So, uh, what are the words or what would you want to say to people who have a patch of land and, you want, and who wants to make a little money on the side? You know, uh, the kind of kitchen garden that I describe uh, uh, will probably satisfy the requirements of a family of four or five partially. Uh, you may not have any surpluses which you can sell outside. You may find something, for example, uh, you know, one crop which I didn't mention, which can be easily cultivated is bindi uh, or lady's finger. Now, you may be able to, when you harvest, you may have some for your use, but some for distribution to your friends or neighbors or people like that. Uh, but this is not a commercial scale cultivation. Now, if you have a field, for example, which is an agricultural land, uh, then you can grow these crops. But then that's a different uh, ball game altogether. Altogether, yeah. Altogether. And uh, I would think that, uh, see, today, uh, the speculative value of land in cities is uh, so high that, uh, you know, it may not make economic sense to do normal agriculture in these lands. But for that, uh, I think in at least in peri-urban areas, may not be in downtown areas, but at least in peri-urban areas, uh, you can actually increase the productivity per unit land by following systems like hydroponics and aeroponics. Maybe uh, in another segment, we can uh, discuss about those uh, methods of cultivation. So, so I wanted to talk to you about that, doctor, about uh, you know, terrace cultivation. You know, terrace is such a huge piece of real estate lying idle in, at the city, essentially. So we'll talk about it another time. And uh, you can last, set uh, small scale things in the terrace as well. Terrace as well. Okay. The last question I wanted to ask you is, I see many people giving up very easily, you know, on kitchen gardens. So, so, uh, so what would you list as, you know, some top personal qualities that people should have? You know, uh, 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 you should be willing to work uh, with your hands. That is, uh, you should be willing to dirty your hands. The soil is not such a bad thing. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, I think particularly the younger generation who have grown up in urban areas in the cities, uh, they don't really appreciate uh, the charm involved in planting, in growing, seeing things growing. 
they sometimes believe that uh, their vegetables or things actually is produced in the departmental store <laughs> rather than the back end of it you know they are not aware okay so uh, some of us elders uh, uh, may want to kind of take them out and show them uh, places and uh, that's one way to get them interested uh, uh, and uh, it's actually such a pleasurable thing uh, you know uh, difficult to describe in tangible terms but that passion should be developed okay that is one the second thing is yes you need some perseverance because uh, you know being a farmer is uh, no joke uh, while uh, uh, it can be quite rewarding uh, you also have to put in uh, some efforts and you have to wait for it uh, initially when you try your hands there can be many challenges you may over irrigate it or suddenly the insect pest will come and these experiences can be frustrating so for a real farmer in our country he doesn't have a choice so he has to cultivate for his livelihood whereas some of us uh, are blessed with multiple choices so uh, at the uh, at the first sight of any resistance we tend to give this up and then go on to something else okay well this is well, 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 well. and uh, if you have a, a rural background agricultural background i think people tend to understand it. Uh, so it's like anything you know keeping a pet uh, okay. all these things you know uh, require some amount of involvement and uh, effort uh, otherwise uh, you are not uh, you know kind to the pet itself uh, and you are not kind to yourself also right big one okay just one last question this may not be too connected but you had mentioned about talking to plants i was just wondering are plants sentient beings no they are not sentient beings in the way that uh, <laughs> we tend to describe them okay but plants do show symptoms uh, so you can uh, in fact uh, for a experienced eye uh, you can make out the plant is uh, suffering from any micronutrient deficiency or whether you know some of these symptoms are quite obvious for example if you don't give enough water the plant will start wilting so that's a symptom which anybody can identify only thing is you have to connect the wilting with uh, either uh, lack of water <laughs> or some infection or something which is preventing the water from properly translocating into the plant but certain other symptoms like certain micronutrient deficiencies these kind of things the symptoms can be quite subtle or it may take a while to develop and for a trained eye uh, they can immediately they may not know the cause but they know that okay if i add some ash to this uh, this one ash contains lot of minerals so to experience they know that and they will see the response immediately the plants also respond very quickly so if you try to uh, suggest a solution or uh, give a solution and if that solution is having the desired uh, results then you know obviously you know you are thrilled Well, right. uh, so I think you can see those things in the plant. That's what I meant by uh, plants talking. Wow! Yes. Superb. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. It was so illuminating this discussion. And viewers, uh, for those of you who are trying to uh, install a kitchen garden at your place, uh, Doctor K K Narayan's talk today was uh, a, such a big springboard. It has uh, so much details, and uh, uh, you could go through that several times, and then. Uh, try and uh, buy the required materials and start off with a small kitchen garden and uh, you know look at the you know, produce that you get yeah today and um, thank you mr dr narayanan and then we'll uh, get back and then we'll talk about another subject another day on urban farmer thank you very much thank you and bye bye